Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video on financial analysis. And today we are going to be looking at imperial brands. So imperial brands, what do they do? Well, you know, we looked at uh, British American Tobacco, BAT, recently, um, and these guys are, well, they're for, formerly Imperial Tobacco Group. They've obviously removed the tobacco uh, from their name, and it's a British multinational tobacco company headquartered in Bristol here in England. It's the world's fourth largest international cigarette company measured by market share after Philip Morris, BAT and Japan and the world's largest producer of fine cut tobacco and tobacco papers. So, um, you know, not an, you know, not an ESG uh, investment business. Now, the reason we're looking at imperial brands is not because it's been recommended, um, but because it is a very high dividend payer. OK, so in this period of high inflation, um, uh, companies that don't pay dividends, the kind of the jam tomorrow, the tech companies have really struggled. But the uh, the dividend players really come into their own. And I've highlighted them there. there. This, this is the list of the top 10 dividend payers in the FTSE 100. Um, and you can see that they are paying a pretty healthy um, 7.2% rate of uh, sort of rate of return effectively, um, which looks pretty good, especially if you're going to get a bit of capital growth in there as well. So I thought it'd be worth just having a look at their financial statements to see what is going on in this company and what can we learn. So here are the financial statements. Um, and uh, very nice and glossy, beautiful, uh, lots of pretty pictures in there. Um, uh, uh, Nothing like you're going to see on the packet of your cigarettes, um, uh, I have to admit. But um, anyway, so um, let's scroll through all the kind of the marketing blurb and who they are and what they do and who's on the board and the corporate governance and the risks and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and whiz all the way down to the numbers. OK, so here we come to the uh, we're going to start with the income statement, um, uh, which will tell us the sales and the costs of this business. So here is the income statement. So we're dealing in millions of pounds. Um, and so we can see for 2022, total revenue, uh, nearly 33 billion pounds. OK, so 32.5 billion pounds, a little bit down on the previous year, um, but not massively. Um, but, you know, clearly a lot of people smoking a lot of cigarettes um, for that kind of a price. So a um, little sort of 1% fall. Um, the costs of sales, quite interesting. Um, they split out this duty and similar items. So they kind of know, look, you know, guys, we're paying a lot of tax on these um, uh, on these uh, uh, cigarettes. Uh, and, um, you know, the actual cost of making the cigarettes themselves is relatively low, but we are paying significant costs in terms of duty. And that's making up about 80, 81% of the sale price. So the gross profit, 6 billion, that's a gross margin of about 20%, just under 20%, 18% last year, 19% this year. They then got the distribution and admin expenses. So uh, this will be kind of you know, the sales and marketing. Um, and in here, you've got sort of the finance team and HR and logistics and IT and all that kind of back office stuff, et cetera, et cetera, leaving them with an operating profit, 2.7 billion. Uh, that's about an 8% operating margin, 10% um, last year, so a little bit down on last year. You can see their admin expenses have, have increased um, fairly significantly, actually, year on year, quite interestingly. Um, no, no real information as to why that is. Um, bit of investment income, suggesting they've got some cash on deposit, investment as or finance costs, suggesting they've got some debt. Just comparing the finance costs to their operating profit doesn't look a massive problem. Um, probably don't want to go too much higher than that. Um, but, you know, certainly the interest cover looks reasonably healthy. They're paying also some corporation tax and that leaves them with a bottom line profit of about 5%. So not massively profitable. Quite a bit down on the previous year um, when it was at 10%. Now, I don't know the sort of exactly the difference. Maybe everyone was sitting at home smoking cigarettes. And, and you may find that this, you know, a significant part of that was things like possibly furlough payments, for example, still people smoking fags um, and we can just put all our admin staff um, uh, uh, in, into kind of furlough and um, get the government to pay for their um, uh, salaries. Anyway, um, there's the profit for the year. Uh, so 1.7 billion. So a fairly sort of significant fall 
um, there, but still making lots of profits. Um, let's have a look at the balance sheet. Uh, in terms of the balance sheet, intangible assets. So that will all be goodwill, this number up here. Um, so this is effectively, a, a, you know, is goodwill on acquisition. So, um, you know, this is the kind of, you know, lots and lots of different brands and they'll have grown, you know, they, they've acquired those brands. So the brand develops, they then acquire them. They uh, acquired at a premium and the premium that they acquire that company at over its net book value um, is known as goodwill. Bit of property, plant and equipment, but really kind of the big driver of their non-current assets is very much um, the goodwill, uh, which is reflection through the expansion. Um, and how did they fund that expansion? Well, they really funded it through debt. So you can kind of see there's the debt coming through, which is funding that expansion. Um, current assets, uh, they got some inventory. Uh, so that's kind of all the sort of cigarettes and, and, and tobacco leaves, uh, people who owe them money and some cash sitting in the bank, reasonable amount of cash there. Um, and they're earning some interest on that cash. Um, and then quite interesting, the, um, the current, liability so um to maybe a kind of our first sort of highlight you know a little bit of a warning sign here is um the current assets compared to the current liabilities now the current assets uh, is uh, 9 billion current liabilities about 11 billion uh, and that's that's you know that's usually a kind of a little bit of a warning sign so from a liquidity point of view we really like the current assets to be higher than the current liabilities that's a ratio of 0 0.8 that says for every dollar we owe and have to pay soon we've only got 80 cents either as cash or coming in as cash soon and actually if we do the acid test um, and eliminate the inventory. So if we say ignore inventory in that equation, um, uh, the ratio is about 0.43. So that says for every dollar we owe and have to pay soon, uh, we um, have 43 cents either as cash or coming in as cash soon, ignoring um, the inventory. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about the inventory. People are smoking. They're pretty addictive and they're going to be able to carry on. Um, uh, they're going to be able to sell that inventory. I'm pretty confident it's not sort of like a fashion led um, uh, business. Um, but it's just kind of just to, 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 um, uh, to highlight that. Now, um, if that is an issue, uh, what we end up with here, you can see here. Um, you've got a very big number on the trade payable. So they've actually got very positive cash flow. Their, their inventory turnover is about 55 days. Their um, accounts receivable is about 30 days, which sounds about right, because that would be the kind of, you know, the standard terms that they would sell. Um, you know, we'll sell it, you pay me in 30 days. Their accounts payable day looks like it's around about 127 days, which is quite a long time. Now, it's either 127 days because they can't pay it, or because they're using the financial muscle uh, in order to not pay it. And I would expect it's probably the latter, not the former, you know, but that's kind of, you know, just a, a sort of a, 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 maybe a kind of, you know, maybe a sort of a debate. So, you know, it, maybe this is a big number because they can't afford it because they haven't got the cash and they're struggling from cash flow, or maybe um, it's because, you know, they don't need to, and they're like, we're absolutely happy to have our, you know, to have our supplies, funding our business okay and and that's perfectly um a perfectly legitimate well, I think it's reasonably legitimate um this debt shouldn't be a problem so um this a billion here that they um they need to pay soon um they're just going to refinance that um uh, you can see that you know the long term uh, uh the long term liabilities and the short term liabilities are pretty consistent year on year suggesting they're refinancing um and they can easily pay the interest so they can refinance it that so that shouldn't be a problem and we'll double check that when we look at the cash flow um, so nothing else really kind of jumping out at, um, uh, jump, jumping out at us, um, uh, just to say that the total equity is about 7.5 billion. So that's the difference between the current uh, between the total assets and the total liabilities. Remember um, uh, that those uh, assets are mainly made up of goodwill and goodwill arises on acquisition of a business. So it's kind of, um, you know, that's, you know, the whole balance sheet is effectively um, uh, just goodwill. So let's have a look at the movement in equity, see what they're doing with that profit. So here we can see um, this is, uh, you yeah, know, this is this year, um, the profit that they're making, there's the profit for the year. 
um, and they are paying out dividends. So reasonable um, uh, dividend payers, as we expected. Um, uh, you know, as we uh, said, um, these are one of the, you know, the, the, the best dividend yield um, uh, in the FTSE. And so most of their profits are being um, paid out as dividends. And that's a very similar story in the previous year as well. We can see the dividends uh, being paid out. So these guys, basically, they're making a profit and they're giving it all back to the shareholders. Um, here is the um, uh, the cash flow um, and the the net cash flow from uh, it, uh, from operating activities. This is the important number here. Very very positive. Um, even before movement in working capital, I'm um, still very positive. So yes, they are profitable. Um, and then if we make some adjustments, depreciation typically being the biggest non-cash expense. So we add it back. And that means that these guys are generating lots and lots of cash. And I think that that may be another reason why they can operate at a lower liquidity ratio than we might otherwise expect. OK, so I wouldn't, I, you know, I'm not sure they want to go much lower than that. But I don't think it's a sign of a company that is struggling to pay its bills. That's my uh, that's my take on it. But I may be wrong. Um been wrong in the past and i'll be wrong again in the future i'm sure anyway um here's the investing activities not a lot of investment going on really um you know purchase of non-current assets but then don't forget um most of their non-current assets is all goodwill it's just investment in you know business that they that they have bought in the past and it's just parked on the balance sheet sitting there doing nothing um and then the part last bit is the financing um, just look at these two numbers here. So we've got the um, the increase in borrowings. That's where they've gone to the bank and borrowed money. There's the repayment of borrowings where they've repaid a borrowing. So these two together indicate refinancing. And you'll notice that there's a little, you know, they're, they're basically on a net basis, they're reducing their debt. So they are bringing the debt down um, so that they pay a little bit less interest. And then the other big part of the financing, um, there's obviously the uh, the interest that they're paying. And then we've got the um, uh, the dividends that are being paid out to the owners. So um, cash, uh, cash from 1.7 billion to 1.3 billion end of last year. That's the beginning of this year. Uh, and then they've got a bit of extra cash in. Um, because they haven't given all that cash out. They've taken a little bit of investing, um, but mainly what they're doing is taking the cash that they're generating uh, from operating activities, that's three billion. They're using a little bit to invest, but mainly they're using some of it to pay down their debt and the rest, um, mainly the big uh, kind of use of that is, is to um, pay the dividends to the shareholders. And of course, if they start to find cash flow as an issue, they can just start to reduce um, those uh, dividend payments if necessary. But it doesn't look like it um, on the face of it. So there is, um, uh, there's our, our, our financial statements. Let's go and have a quick look at the, um, the share price. So here is the share price. Um, market cap is 17 uh, 0.5 billion um so uh you know it, it's a it's a p ratio of uh you know 11 times i've got about 10 times 11 times earnings um which looks you know not expensive that's a yield that's an earnings yield of nine and a half percent now don't forget you know imperial brands will be a company that you know people don't like it's you know if you're part of an, the esg brigade it's not going to be in your esg um fund you know your ethical and social kind of investing and all that kind of like you know love your planet type of stuff these are you know this, this is nasty product that causes cancer and kills people um but it's addictive and it's legal and it's very very profitable so um you know this is cheap uh so if you can get past the ethics part of the investing, um, then, you know, you can possibly pick up, you know, a relatively cheap company um, with a, you know, a pretty healthy dividend yield. Now, are you going to get capital growth from this? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't know about the capital growth. Um, it, it's you know, I mean, there's obviously significant headwinds um, uh, in terms of, you know, legislation and people, are, you know, there are countries who are trying to raise the kind of, you know, the price at which you can buy cigarettes and therefore kind of basically, you know, eliminate um, the purchase of tobacco. Um, so, you know, as a long term investment, I'm not sure this is kind of, you know, the stuff of tomorrow, so to speak. But, you know, in terms of today, it's cheap and it's paying out a pretty decent um, dividend. So, um, you know, you can make of that. Um, uh, what you will. Um, just uh, on a last um, a last note, we always like to just have a look at the um, uh, the uh, uh, the CEO, see what the CEO is being paid, so uh, we can find um, our friend uh, Stefan Bomhard. 
um, uh, and what he's being paid. Here it is. Um, so remuneration. So his total pay, uh, about five and a half million um, uh, pounds. So he's doing pretty well, pretty healthy increase in pay from three and a half million pounds in the previous year. So he's seen a very healthy 65 percent um, pay increase. So I'm um, clearly feeling very pleased with himself and laughing all the way to the bank. Um, so 5.7 million, how does that um, compare with our employees? Well, uh, we need to dig into the uh, into the accounts a little bit deeper, into the notes to the accounts to find our employee um, remuneration. And here is the employee uh, remuneration. So um, 2022, all employees were paid a total of 877 million pounds. Yeah, here we go. So number of people employed in the group. Um, so the average, we're just going to take the average rather than the year, and the average during the year is about 28,600. So if you pay 28,600 people and you pay them 80, 877 million pounds, you're paying on average uh, just under 31,000 pounds per person. It's 30,664 pounds per person. Um, interesting, if you run the numbers on the previous year, um, uh, significant um, uh, more people paid um, uh, uh, considerably more. Um, the average pay worked out at 35,000. So that's an average fall of 12%. Okay, so our director, our CEO, has seen a pay rise of 65%, and the average pay um, in the business has gone down by 12%. Now, don't forget that's going to be a mix um, because if you take somebody who's in head office and paid lots of money and, and get rid of them um, uh, and, and still pay, uh, you could still give you know the people kind of working on the farms. Um, uh, who are paid a pittance, you can still give them a significant pay rise. So this is very much average figures, um, but it's quite interesting. So uh, Stefa paid 186 times the average salary of the average worker, which is um, quite a lot, uh, but not the most we see, definitely not the most. So there we go. There is Imperial Brands. I hope you found that analysis useful and interesting and informative. Um, uh, maybe you're looking at this because you are thinking about investing in them. Maybe you are looking to work for them. You want to do maybe you're doing a project um, at school or at university and you want to sort of know more about the company. Uh, maybe you're looking to sell to them. Maybe you're looking to buy from them. Um, you know, whatever your use is, you know, learning the language of business finance is, you know, really useful skill. It is the language of business. Learning to speak financial, um, uh, be able to talk the finances um, uh, is a really, really useful skill. So I hope you found it useful. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Click the link um, below and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Hello, thank you for watching that video and I hope you found its contents useful. If you want to know more about what we do here at Talk Financials, you can find out on talkfinancials.com uh, where we uh, will explain how we design, develop and deliver training workshops for companies all over the world. Uh, we've worked with over 300 companies in over 35 countries around the world, uh, helping them to understand financial statements, to understand uh, business finance and to become fluent in the language of business finance. Uh, if you're interested in developing your own skills in how you read and interpret financial statements, um, I've developed an online workshop, uh, which is available. All you've got to do is click on the QR code there, uh, point your camera at the QR code, um, and that will take you through to an online workshop. Uh, and it will help you to improve your own ability to read and interpret financial statements. Uh, I've also written a book called How to Talk Finance. Uh, and again, that is available. Um, if you click on the QR code, it'll take you through to the Amazon website where you can buy the book either as a hard copy or as a Kindle edition. Um, and that's really everything from me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, it'd be great to stay in touch. If you'd like to contact me, um, then again, just click on the QR code um, uh, and send me a message. Uh, and good luck with uh, your financial analysis. I hope it goes well.